All right, class, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, uh, or good morning, I should say. I'm so glad you're here watching this video. Um, <laughs> this is going to be the second time I'm recording this video, because the first time I did it, there was no audio. The mute button was on. So that's not just a problem for Zoom calls, that's a problem for making videos also. So today we're going to talk about Lesson 12. In Lesson 12, we are looking at ionic bonds, it was Lesson 11. Today, we're looking at covalent bonds. Now, covalent bonds, if you remember one thing and one thing only from this lesson, what I want you to remember is I want you to remember that in ionic bonds, they're stealing. In covalent bonds, electrons are sharing. So in ionic bonds, we steal. Covalent, we share. And what is it that we steal and share? We steal and share electrons. So make sure everything that's on my page is written in your notes so that you know how to answer these questions and how to move forward from there. Now, <clears throat> if we review a little bit, so metals and non-metals, when they combine, they form ionic compounds. Ionic compounds, an ion is a charged particle, and there are two types, anions and cations. Anions are the negative ions. And you remember that because that an prefix means not or negative. And then if you like cats, cats are the plus. Um, so a reaction between a metal and a nonmetal, one that forms a positive ion and a negative ion, combine to form an ionic compound. Those ionic compounds are brittle. They easily dissolve in water. They have high melting points. Um, and when you dissolve them in water, they conduct electricity really well. But remember, they're brittle. And today we're going to talk about um, covalent compounds. So the other difference thing that was that they had different electronegativities. That's E neg. Now, those electronegativities are different. And what that means is, remember, electronegativity is like if you flex, like how strong does it want? those electrons. So something with a high electronegativity grabs the electrons and kind of pulls it to itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Low in electronegativities, like, get rid of that electron. I don't want it. So if we combine <coughs> a metal, sodium, with a nonmetal, chlorine gas, Sodium has a really low electronegativity. It's like, get rid of those electrons. I don't want them. Chlorine has a really high electronegativity. It's like, excellent. Let me, let me take those electrons, all of the electrons. So what happens is, is chlorine steals sodium's electrons, making it a negative charge. And sodium loses its electron, giving it a positive charge. And then those two are attracted together because opposites attract. Now, these twos in front of here, we're going to take a look at that later this unit. But it has to do with the fact that we must have, because of the law of conservation of mass, the same number of sodiums on this side of the equation as on that side of the equation. Now, to make this happen, we have to have different electronegativities. To have different electronegativities, we need a positive and a negative. But what if we had two nonmetals reacting that have similar electronegativities. Well, what's going to happen is called a covalent bond. Now, that covalent bond, what is it? What it is, is it's a connection where you are sharing two electrons. Now, the way that I like to think about this is imagine you and a sibling, or if you don't have a sibling, imagine you have a sibling. Let's imagine that you guys have a toy that you deeply, deeply love. My son just brought me this um, from the other room. This is a giant elephant. Um, and let's say you and your brother or sister love this element. And so at first you want to just take it and steal it. Say, it's mine. And your sibling's like, no, I want it. It's mine. 
Now, if you are much stronger and bigger than your other sibling, they might just steal it and take it from you and run away. And, you know, you'd have to go get your mom and be like, Mom, he's stealing my stuff. Now, or if they were bigger and stronger or faster or sneakier or more motivated than you, they could grab it and run away with it. But if you were equally strong and you tried to, to take it, you would have to share this with each other. But when you share a toy, you couldn't go in the kitchen and your brother go in the bathroom if you're both trying to play with it and share it at the same time. You are stuck together in the same location. You'd have to be like, oh, I'm an elephant with flowers. Oh, I, I am also an elephant with flowers. We like playing elephants with... Okay, I'll, I'll stop that. Now, but when you share, you have to keep close together. So by sharing, you can't be really far from each other. You hang out close together. So how does this work with atoms? So it's a little bit tricky to see here with the picture. Let me see if that light helps. That eh, helps a little bit. But if we go here, what I've drawn is two chlorine atoms. And I drew this in all green and this one in green and blue. Now, if we look at this chlorine atom right here and this one right here, they each have seven valence electrons. Seven valence electrons. Now, if we look at these, we remember, oh yeah, valence electrons. So chlorine, oh man. Oh, that's right, chlorine is a halogen. That means it's in the seventh column. So it has seven valence electrons. And if it just gets one more valence electron, well then it's full. Oh yeah, Mr. Jacobs, that means that chlorine is highly electronegative. And that's going to want to try and steal atom, or electrons. Oh, but wait a second, there's another chlorine and they're equally strong. So what they wind up doing is they share one of their electrons each with each other. Let me show you why. So if we zoom in here, zoom through the power of technology. If you just look at this one, as long as it's just talking about, hey, here's that shared green one and all the blue ones that go around it, this chlorine now has eight. And if we do that on this side, this chlorine also has eight. As long as they each share one electron with the other, we get eight valence electrons each, which is really stable because it has a full outer shell of electrons. Remember, that outer shell of electrons is called the valence shell of electrons. Now, you look at that and you go, wait a second. I remember chlorine is a diatomic molecule. That means that chlorine, when it forms a molecule, can form a molecule with itself. That is why it's a diatomic molecule, Mr. Jacobs, because there are two shared electrons here. The way you draw this two shared electrons, you can draw it as a line connecting those two things. That line represents the covalent bond or the connection with those shared electrons of the two electrons for each of the atoms sharing and holding them together. That connection is a covalent bond. And if we have that, boom, we've made a connection. And if there's a connection there, so that we have two chlorine atoms, we have a stable molecule. So why does chlorine form a diatomic molecule? Well, because then it's a stable molecule. And that is amazing. Now, we can do this with other compounds. So let's take a look at natural gas. Natural gas is in the form of methane. Now, methane is CH4. Carbon has four valence electrons. Hydrogen has one valence electron. Now, hydrogen is kind of funny. Remember, hydrogen, it only has one electron. So to have a full outer shell, it must have two because that first ring, remember when we were drawing these, that first ring can only hold two electrons. That means that hydrogen will be satisfied if there are two electrons. So 
CH4 is methane. And if carbon has one, two, three, four electrons, and then it, each of the hydrogens share its one electron with carbon, well, take a look. Carbon has eight valence electrons, and carbon is happy. And the hydrogens, let's see if I can cover these up quite right. The hydrogens each have two valence electrons, and so they're all happy and stable as well. As long as they have those connections, we get this CH4 molecule. The way that we could draw this, so this is with dots, you could also draw this with lines representing each of those pair of electrons. So that's carbon with four bonds connected to it, and each of the hydrogens connected to those carbons. Now, for this class, and you'll see this many times in like a biology class, we're gonna use a little shortcut. Now, this isn't the only way to do this. In fact, this way will lead you astray when you get a little bit older. But for right now, I feel like this is something we can handle and do. Hydrogen, if hydrogen can make one bond, hydrogen is happy because then it's got those two valence electrons in its outer shell. Sulfur and oxygen can both make two bonds. Nitrogen needs three bonds in order to be happy. If it can share three electrons, then it will have a full valence shell. Why? Well, because hydrogen, or excuse me, nitrogen, one, two, three, four, has five electrons. So if it can convince something else to come in and share one, two, three electrons with it by making these bonds, then it will have a full valence shell. So each of these just represents the number of bonds it needs in order to have a full valence shell. Carbon needs four. And then the halogens, those are column seven again, need just one thing connected to them. This takes us to H2O. So if we look at H2O, H2O has two hydrogens and one oxygen. Oxygen needs two bonds in order to be full. Hydrogen needs one bond in order to be full. So if we arrange them like this, one, two, three, all of a sudden we're happy and everything has the right number of valence electrons to be completely satisfied. This is why if you tried to draw like this, those connections wouldn't work out because this hydrogen would have two connection to it or four valence electrons, and that's not stable. Oxygen would only have one connection. So if we follow these rules right here, and if we were at school, we'd be doing this with these really cool little atomic models that kind of like snap together. Um, but this one doesn't work. Now, there's another way to do this, um, and you should write this down, but if you don't fully follow it, this is what we'll do in high school. So let's say, if we want to, we could track the number of valence electrons available in the molecule. So hydrogen <clears throat> has one valence electron each, but there are two hydrogens in an H2O molecule. So one valence electron plus one valence electron, and then oxygen has six valence electrons, giving us eight in total. Now, if we take those eight and we arrange those electrons around the different atoms so that hydrogen just has two and oxygen has four connected to it and then it's sharing those two, you get the same configuration. So let's take a look. Let's do another one. Let's do NH3. So NH3 is ammonia. You'll see this in many cleaning solutions. This is a base. Nitrogen can get three connections to it. Hydrogen gets one connection to it. So NH3 looks like this. Let's do another one. Let's say I had CH3CL. Um, to do this, I'm going to put carbon in the middle because carbon needs four connections. And then I've got H, H, 
H, and then chlorine is a halogen, so that'll go here, and all of a sudden we're all satisfied. Carbon has four connections, chlorine has one, and hydrogen each has one. Another place you'll see this, this is really common in biological molecules. So for extra credit, if you want to try drawing this molecule, this is O6, this is glucose, and no fair just looking it up online, uh, what the chemical structure is for this. But if you can make this all work together, you can have different pieces. Now, the cool part about this is we can also have double bonds. So let's say I have C4H4. What I can have here is if I connect my two carbons together and I connect a hydrogen to each of those, hydrogens are all happy. Ooh, but carbons only have three connections each. But if I did a double connection here, then carbon has one, two, three, four. This carbon has one, two, three, four. And boom, we've got our molecule. Now, these are a little bit trickier to do with the double bonds. We'll do a little bit more practice on these in our live class Friday morning. So another couple examples of those. So all the diatomic molecules are all covalent molecules. So the diatomics, are covalent molecules. Oxygen is an example of that, is O2. Remember, oxygen forms two bonds. That means that if we have a double bond in between these two oxygens, bam, bam, we have happy oxygen and a happy oxygen, which is a stable oxygen, which is why O2 forms a diatomic molecule. Nitrogen, triple bond, bing, bang, boom. One, two, three. If it has three connections to itself, then it's stable. This is also why it's really hard to take nitrogen from the air and use it because it's got three connections to itself that you have to break holding it together. All right, so here's some properties of covalent bonds. Uh, covalent bonds typically form between nonmetals. They don't conduct electricity well. They're often light and strong. Now, this is as opposed to ionic bonds, right? Ionic bonds, hmm, metal and a nonmetal. They do conduct electricity well. They tend to be brittle and dense. Covalent bonds have similar electronegativities. Ionic bonds have different electronegativities. And then covalent bonds do not dissolve well in water, whereas ionic bonds dissolve very well in water. Now, I know this kind of went by pretty fast and there was a lot to absorb here because there are new things. We're gonna go over more of these in our live class on Monday. But right now I wanna go over the questions that we have that the textbook asks. So as we look at these, if you haven't done these already, go ahead and do them and then come back. Pause the video here. So what is a covalent bond? A covalent bond is, an, is a connection between atoms where we're sharing electrons. What are some common characteristics of covalent compounds? We just went over those, so they're nonmetals. They don't conduct electricity. They are light and strong. They have similar electronegativities, and they don't dissolve well in water. The most common covalent compound on Earth is water. That's the most common covalent compound in you as well. You're about 70% water. Why do diatomic for molecules form covalent bonds instead of ionic bonds? Well, it's because their electronegativities are identical. Why? Well, because they're identical atoms. If they're identical atoms, then they're going to have identical electronegativities. They're going to want to pull just as hard as the other atom. So instead of trying, being able to steal, they're forced to share. And then, would you expect more compounds to be ionic bonds or covalent bonds? This question actually doesn't really have a good answer. So you can make a case for either of these. There are many, many, many compounds within the Earth's crust that are ionic compounds. Um, in you, you, if you were looking at 
yourself, you are almost entirely covalent compounds. All the important biological and living things that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, plastics, wood, um, the food that you eat, the chair that you're sitting on, are almost all covalently bound compounds. So for that question, I'm going to count the answer correct as long as you made a reason for why you think that's the case. Okay, so we kind of blew through those questions pretty quick. If you've already turned in your questions, no need to update your answers for these and return them back in. But make sure you did copy down the right answers and you know what they are for when we get to our test. On that note, I hope that you guys, oh, I'm upside down. I hope that you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, I look forward to seeing you all on Friday. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks.